So welcome everyone to our second museum time machine, Destination 3D with Jesse Pruitt. He will be taking us through today's um, Q&A. Just before we get started, I do want to mention that we are recording this and it will be posted to YouTube. Um, next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Andy Spear, where he will discuss the um, life of a projectile point. Um, and that will post on our website and Facebook page for links if you want to register for that. So I will let Jesse take it away and feel free to ask questions as we go through and we will answer them as they pop up. Hey everyone, happy to be here. So as Amber said, my name is Jesse Pruitt. I manage a, a 3D lab here at the museum called the Idaho Virtualization Laboratory. It's, uh, it's basically a multifaceted 3D lab. It started all the way back in 2002, and it's been uh, it's been operating nonstop since then in various capacities. But um, primarily, our goal is disseminating museum collections to the world at large. So um, we're a 3D scanning lab. So we have um, a range of technology like 3D scanners. Um, we also employ CT scanning technology, and um, more recently, we've gotten to uh, start doing digital sculpting for museum exhibits and things like that. So if you're not familiar with, with 3D scanning technology, there's a, there's a wide range of technologies out there that make that possible for us. The bulk of what we use is a technology called um, laser scanning. So it's uh, uh, pretty much as it sounds, it's a nice um, blue light laser. It shoots out and intersects an object on the surface and there's a camera there that looks at how that laser deforms over the surface of that and then from there, it does a lot of really fancy math and it'll generate a 3D surface from that. We also have um, units called Structure Light, which operate very similarly. Instead of a laser line though, they shoot out a, a QR code. If you're familiar with QR codes, the checker pattern, black and white, it shoots out one of those and then it hits the surface. And the exact same thing, it looks at how that light deforms over the surface of that object. And then it'll triangulate that into a three-dimensional object. So we use that for things that started getting a little bit too big for our laser scanners, but um, that the detail it captures isn't quite as clean as the lasers, but it still does a really good job of capturing really big things. And then from there, we step up to a LIDAR unit, which is made for um, really terrestrial scanning, but we use it for scanning really big, big things, um, usually cave systems. Um, we do, a, we scan rock art, stuff like that with it. And then um, we also facilitate other people's research. So we are often um, uh, processing CT data and things like that to uh, look at things that are inside rocks primarily where we do a lot of paleontology in the lab so we're looking at things that are buried in rock or, or sediment or things like that so that we can we can see what's in there we can extract that data out and turn it into 3d stuff so i'm going to show you some examples of some of the the work we've been doing here let me share my screen so if you go to sketchfab which is a a largely free facility. It's a website that um, a lot of museums are using to, to easily share their 3D data. You're able to look at stuff like this, um, great horned owl skeleton in 3D, and of course you can zoom in and out on it, and it's, it's really cool. You, a lot of people won't get the chance to, to see these skeletons because they're, uh, they're protected um, here in the United States due to various laws, so you're really not allowed to own these skeletons or, or handle them, but now if you look here, we made it so that it can be downloaded. So you can click over here, you can download the model if you uh, take the time to create a login there. And you have a 3D printer, you can 3D print this, and then it's perfectly legal to have a great horned owl skeleton in your, in your house. This one, it pops up a little low resolution on the viewer, that's just a limitation of the website, but um, the data is pretty high resolution. You can check that out in various forms. Let's see. So if you look at our, our main Sketchfab page, we've been uploading stuff here for almost five years now. I think we have a just a huge range of material on here, and we've got it organized by collections. So if you click on the collections button, you can see um, some of the things we have here. Most of it's public, some of it's not. So you might get a sneak peek at something in here, but there's nothing nothing too too gnarly. I don't think. So, for example, if you look in this BOR paleontology folder, this is a pretty cool 
um, project that we worked with the Bureau of Reclamation here in Idaho. Um, if any of you guys are local or if you've been through the area, you know we've got a, a big reservoir called American Falls Reservoir. And there's a over the years there's been quite a bit of fossil material come out of there. And one of the one of the primary things that comes out of there is these giant um, giant horned bison called bison latifrons. And the Bureau of Reclamation um, worked with us to uh, digitize several complete skeletons of these animals and then uh, allowed us to put it online so that everybody can access it and it's all downloadable and can be 3d printed for for pretty much anything it's an open source um it's an open source set of data so if you wanted to put this in a video game or uh, 3d print it and put it on your desktop or mount you know one of these really cool sets of horns on the hood of your truck you could you could do that so that's some of the stuff we had there um, Let's see, we'll back back out of there. No, but I want to look at the, look at that again. Go back here to collections. And then we, we have these complete skeletons. These can also be downloaded. Um, walk you guys through a little bit of the, the way we do this. Let's see if we can find something kind of cool. Here we go. If you haven't ever seen an arm, armadillo skeleton, these guys are really cool, kind of walking around in their own house all the time. So this is a this is a nine banded probably count those but it's an armadillo skeleton you can see that there are uh, some pretty wild creatures in there so what we do is we take these animals and we'll lay them out on a table uh, starting at the head we'll work through the vertebrae all the way down to the tail and then once we have that we'll figure out the left and right side of the arms and legs and then the ribs and we'll lay those out and then we'll we scan each one of these bones individually so these are let's see if we can zoom in get out of there a little bit but zoom in here you can see these bones aren't really connected they're just sort of hovering there in a in a space so every one of those bones is scanned individually and then we stick them all back together and we put them online you can download these so if you wanted to 3d print this skeleton um, you might have to take a couple of extra steps to uh, to join these bones together or else the, the 3d printer might uh, might have some problems there but so is that guy so that's all, all free and available to people. We also have, let me see, uh oh, can I, let's see, I'm having technical difficulties here. I've got a, I've got a menu that's preventing me from, there it goes. Right, sorry about that. We also have this website, which is um, it's our own personal website that's connected to our, our museum here. We call it the Idaho Virtual Museum. What we do here is the same thing as Sketchfab. If you click in here and uh, look at this stuff, it'll take you to links that are shared from Sketchfab, but this is a centralized space that we also share with our, our herbarium. So there's, you know, there's a huge number of plants in here. We have a lot more artifacts here than we do on Sketchfab, just due to, to rights and sharing things with that. But it's all broken down, so you can come in here. We've got our, we've got our really cool dinosaurs. We've got Ceratosaurus and Cosmoceratops up there. Um, we've got our fish. Um, if you're familiar with our regional area here, you'll see that we've got most of our, our helicoprion fossils are, are all online here. And they're all in 3D. So if you wanted to take a look at these really weird sharks we have in Idaho that Leaf will be talking about in two weeks, I think. It'll be talking about these guys more in depth, but these are some of our really cool sharks. So make sure you check that out, because they're uh, these are just wild little animals. But Idaho's got a, for some odd reason, it has this weird, uh, weird population of these sharks. It's just really cool to be here if you're into sharks, which everybody should be into sharks. So there's that website. And then we have, if you're doing research or if you're, you're more in, into teaching, or if you're looking for uh, ways to incorporate 3D data uh, more, more seamlessly into a curriculum or something like that, we're also hosting all of our data on this website called MorphoSource, which is um, just, it's a free open source, the same models, they're all up here. Um, yeah, I'll all be there. It's free to download. You can click on these things and download them and 3D print them or any number of things like that. So that's what we've been doing there. And then I keep mentioning, I keep mentioning 3D printing, so I figured I would show all you some uh, 3D prints that we have here. So um, a big part of what we do here in the lab is exhibit fabrication. Over the past couple of years, 
and we, uh, so it's myself, I have another co-worker named Tim, and then we have, um, we have four interns now that work with us that are, I'm teaching them how to do the 3D stuff, and they're learning um, digital sculpting and 3D printing and things. So we're uh, working on various exhibits, but we're doing stuff like these. Um, this is a North American lion skull, it's a cat called Panthera atrox. So this is full size, that's how big they got, and compare that to my, my big nog in there. These are uh, apex predators that used to live here in our, our region here in Pocatello. These are found at the American Falls Reservoir that I was mentioning earlier. Just really big cats. So this is, uh, this is something that um, you couldn't really mold or cast. Um, the material we have, it's really fragile coming out of the reservoir. So we, uh, we did a combination of 3D scanning and uh, digital sculpting to recreate this skull. And then we can just create as many copies as we want. So more on this guy soon. We're, uh, we've got a pretty cool exhibit coming together on this. Keep an eye out for that. And then we've got, I mentioned CT scanning. So if any of you have ever been to a doctor and gotten a CT scan, you, uh, you might have the option to do something like this. So this is, this is my skull. It's, so if you look at that guy. Um, so I, uh, I had a sinus surgery earlier last year and I had to get a CT scan before that. So I took the, uh, the CT scan and processed it and 3D printed my skull because I always want to look like, and it turns out I'm a, I'm a fairly European male individual. You can see I've got the, the classic hallmarks of a, a European descended male there and a little bit, um, at least to me, it looks a little bit Neanderthalish too. I've got some, got some pretty strong brow ridges there. It's a big, thick head. So that's, that's that stuff, but then we experiment over the years. So we're, uh, Hey Jesse. Yeah. Before you keep going, you have a couple of questions. Oh. Yeah. So I moved that slightly off screen there. Okay. We have not printed a hyena don at this point. Hope. Oh, um, we. Uh, let's see. It's on the agenda, right? Those are big, cool skulls, and that's always something we're we're trying to move towards. So we're. Uh, it's 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 on the list. So hopefully. And yes, we are the we are the people that printed the giant spider. Um, that's that's me. I've got his little spider warning. I've got his little cousin here. This is my my initial test print of that spider before we uh, before we committed to printing it at full size. Just to see how things are going to work out proportionally. And I was going to take you guys into the gallery and look at some of our bigger three D printed stuff, but they're doing construction in there right now. Now that the university is closed, so I'm not able to not able to get in there. Yeah, the, the spider was a lot of fun. That was that was entirely a digital sculpt. So that process, I'll be showing you here in just a little bit, some of the ZBrush stuff we're, we're doing. But yeah, just looking at photos, I was able to find online of those spiders and then sculpting it out and preparing it for 3D printing. And it was 3D printed on this big 3D printer I got going back here that I'll show, show everybody here in just a few minutes. So one of the things we've been looking at doing is looking at ways to, uh, you know, make this stuff more widely available to various markets. So we took, uh, we've been playing around with, with 3D printing and then doing bronze casting. I don't know if this is showing up all that well in the, in the light there, but so this is a, a solid metal, get a solid piece of bronze cast bison latifron. So we scanned the skull, 3D printed it in miniature here. And then our uh, art department here on campus has a, has a foundry. So they were able to take that plastic 3D print and turn it into a, a metal 3D print for us, which is really cool. You can still see some of the print lines in there, which makes it kind of cool. So the, the technology we have here is really varied. Um, we have we have in-house, I think we're up to nine or 10 3D printers here at the museum. I have three, four, five, six here, and then now we must have 10 because our, our education department has four 3D printers now, I think, or five. Maybe we have 11. We have a lot of 3D printers here at the museum, various kinds. Um, uh, the really big one we have, which we haven't named yet, uh, I just call it the big one because it's, it's the big one we have going behind us, which is a pretty cool machine. That's a standard FDM type machine, so it um, just takes plastic and extrudes it out. Um, let's see, so if you look at... This is a pretty cool little thing that shows the lines pretty well. So if you look at this guy, these are some of the toys we, we play around with here at the museum. But let's see if we can get in there. If you can get the light to catch it, you can see the, the layer lines that 
come in here. So these, um, this is just a standard 3D print. Um, you get a desktop 3D printer for your house. That's the one that's going to have um, just lays down plastic and lines. But we also have the resin printers. So the spider was a resin print. Um, this this American alligator skull is a, a 3D print. And if you see the the detail that you get on these is just really clean. It's a really nice 3D print, but they're they're pretty small, right? So this is the maximum size we're able to print in resin uh, currently in house. We have a we have a bigger resin printer on order that'll be here soon, but you know, they're pretty small. And then yeah, we got, here, let's see if I can disconnect from my power source and we'll show you. So the really fun thing that I like about 3D printing is that it's scalable. So when we're building exhibits, we usually start out with a small scale version like this shark here. This is a, if you came through our museum last year, we had an exhibit here with Hillica Pryan and we added this guy to it, which is Edestus, it's his weird cousin with the, the blade of teeth in his upper and lower jaw. So we start small and then we scale up. So I'm gonna walk you guys over, hopefully don't get too motion sick. And then, he does this 3D. So we got the teeth and the eyes and we can walk all the way down this guy. So we got his, his gills, which are pretty cool. So this is an 11 foot long shark that we 3D printed here in house. And then a lot of sanding, a lot of painting. When is that? And then we can show you guys the big 3D printer we got here. So this is our this is our workhorse 3D printer. It's a uh, was built for us by a company called 3D Platform. Let's see how close we can get in here. So what you're seeing there is there's the the filament path that comes up through here. I'm gonna take you down here and show you. So just down here. Maybe a little dark. So, so we got a big spool of filament back here that comes up through here, goes up that tube, and it comes out. Then there's basically just a fancy hot glue gun that's driven by a computer over there that's laying down the plastic. And it does that one layer at a time, so that's why you end up with that stair stacked sort of appearance, the sides of things. What we're printing there is that's a about the back third of a minky whale cranium at full scale. So by the time that's done, it's gonna be a little over seven feet long, I think, in terms of total length for that guy. That 3D printer has some pretty fancy features. It's got a filament sensor and things like that in it. So, you know, it runs out of filament, it'll let us know. Are there things that are not 3D printable? Absolutely, so that's one of the one of the things you have to be careful about. Um, 3D printing as a whole, um, you can print a lot of stuff, but um, like for example, the spider, to print that, I had to break this down into, I think ended up with 13 different pieces to make it printable. And even then it required a lot of support material and things that made it kind of difficult to clean up. There are, if you look at things, let's see, like a Fabergé egg or something like that, something super intricate with a lot of holes and a lot of um, spots. Really isn't gonna 3D print all that well unless you use some really expensive 3D printing technology. Um, generally things that are really small can't be 3D printed. I didn't bring any of the, the smaller things. We do print little little skull earrings that we sell in our gallery that are you know, they're about a inch long, inch and a quarter long or something like that. And they print pretty well. You can still capture some of the details, but once you get too small, um, they don't print really well. And then really thin things. So if you're trying to print things, um, like if you wanted to sculpt hair onto something and have realistic hair on a, on a model, 3D printing that would be really difficult unless you did something um, really crazy. If you follow 3D printing, there's a guy made a, a lion that has a 3D printable mane that comes out in a cylinder of little spider web things and you can take a hair dryer and heat it up and sculpt its hair into various stuff. But when I'm talking about, um, let's see if I can grab this without breaking everything. Talking about support material, this is a, this is the mandible of a, the Mickey whale that I'm printing back here. This is his left jaw. And you can see down here on the bottom, 
all of this stuff. That's that's support material. And there was really no way to orient this thing. Um, there's my, my paper tube I was using to hold it together. There's no real way to orient this that didn't require support material. And then getting this off, um, you know, it creates some problems. If you can see, you can see right here, this surface doesn't look really great compared to, you know, this side surface here is nice and smooth and clean. Um, so there was support material touching it right there. And that's going to require a bunch of cleanup. We'll have to sand that down. And then we uh, we often will have to uh, you know, take something like wood putty or um, recently we started using a, an art resin, which is really nice. It doesn't have a smell and it it uh, is less toxic than you know getting something like JB Weld epoxy or something from Home Depot. Um, you put that on there, then it'll you can sand that down. It'll fill in these these layer lines so you don't get this sort of scratchy texture to it. And then you can sand that down a lot easier than the plastic. Yeah. But I mean, yes and no. That's a long winded way of saying yes and no. You can print anything if you're willing to take the time to glue it back together, I guess. But in general, there, you know, it's it's pretty difficult to um, 3D print realistic things with the technology we have. So if you look at the back of my skull here, you can see just how terrible the lines and things are back there. That's because I oriented this thing on the bed like this, which is the best way to print it, right? So if I tried to print it like this, then all my teeth would have needed support, all of the, my little, my mastoid processes and all these little processes in here, stylohyoids and whatnot, would have would have needed um, you know, support material and those probably wouldn't have printed that well so that was the best way to do it but then you know you have a lot of support material so if i wanted to do this properly what i would have done is i would have cut it you know probably here and then printed that flat on the bed and then printed this separate and then glued that together but then you have to take um you know some type of filler like i mentioned earlier and fill that in sand that down then you're going to lose details in those areas because you're sanding it so then you have to go back through and post process that in there so it, it it's a give and take um, we're getting closer to where anything is printable, um, especially with technologies like um, selective laser sintering, which uses a nylon powder and a fancy laser to, to melt a pattern in that. And then the, the powder itself is its own support material. So no matter how intricate a design is, there's always support there. And then when the design is done, you just pull the design out of the powder, blow all the excess powder off, and then you can uh, heat it in an oven to anneal that material together, but it's really expensive. So something like this on a resin printer, that costs, you know, nine, 10 bucks to, to print. If you did that on a, an SLS machine, you're probably looking at $50, $60 to 3D print something like this. And that's a really small thing, right? So if you, you start scaling that up, it gets really expensive really quickly. And that's, a, that's one of those things where a company that has that technology has patented it. So there's no, uh, um, for the time being, there's nobody else that's sort of coming in and taking that and doing um, different things with it, making it open source, and you know, there's no competition for them, so it stays expensive. But um, like with everything in 3D printing, once those patents expire, then we'll start seeing some really cool things popping up in people's houses. Jesse, what's been your favorite and least favorite thing to 3D print? Uh, Probably the spider is both of those. That was a that was a fun 3D print. I really enjoyed working on that. But the post processing on it was just terrible. The the process of adding the hair and and all of that to it just turned it into a a real nightmare to to mess with. Um, would you have done something differently? Now that you've been through the whole process, would you have done something differently? Yeah, I probably would have spent more money and uh, bought some prefabricated hair or something as opposed to doing that by hand. Um, uh, why were we printing the spider? So we had an exhibit, um, well, it's still ongoing here right now. That opened up in January, right? Um, it's called uh, In the Shadows. It's a really cool exhibit here for, for um, basically anything that's happening here in the state of Idaho that you don't see very often. We've got um, spiders, we've got mountain lions, which you'll see occasionally, but you know, they most often stick to the nighttime and you don't see them very often. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's just an exhibit called In the Shadows. So what we wanted to do, the goal was to bring the stuff that you really don't see a lot of in Idaho and make it so that everybody 
can see it, they're aware of it, and that's why we decided to make the wolf spider, you know, so much larger than life, is because they're, you know, we're, the goal of those is to let people know that, yeah, they're big, they're scary, they've got hair, and they look really gross, but they're really beneficial to have in your home. Um, they're, they they don't bother people, they, they, they eat a lot of pests, so if you, if you see one in your house, it's generally a sign that you have a healthy ecosystem in your home, and they're, they're eating things, um, they eat, um, occasionally they'll eat black widows, they'll, they'll attack, um, you know, the hobo spiders, the things that you don't want in your house, they sort of feed on and do that sort of stuff. And plus, I, you know, my boss was asking what we could do, and I was like, oh, we can print a big spider, and he's, he, he said, well, how big can you print it? And I just laughed and said, how big do you want it? Because I, I, I wanted to, <laughs> that was the, I guess that's the crux of it. I wanted to print a giant spider and this exhibit gave me the, the opportunity to do that. It's, it's been pretty fun. So we have a question from Facebook. Um, Sylvia says, can you 3D print soft things? Mm, yes and no. Um, not, so you couldn't print things like a, like you couldn't print a, a plushy animal. Um, we don't, we just don't have the technology there, but you can print fabrics which move, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, so you can, you can print stuff like that. And then there are flexible materials that give you um, the ability to, to print things that are semi-flexible. I don't have anything here on hand because they're, they're kind of difficult to print with, but, um, Depending on the type of printer you have, you can print things that are super squishy, um, almost like a you know little stress balls or stuff you get when you uh, little soccer balls and stuff like that. They're almost like that, but um, you know those present their own challenges. So if you're if you're trying to print something with a flexible filament, if you ever um, been playing with your your spaghetti at dinner, it's a lot like trying to push around a a spaghetti noodle that's been cooked, right? It's super flexible, and when you're trying to print it, you know if you've got this big machine behind me here. Imagine trying to push a, a cooked spaghetti noodle up through that tube and then all the way back down. It's, it can happen. Uh, you need a you need a setup to do it, but yeah, you can print some soft things, but not not like plushy style soft. All right. Well, I'll see. So I'm gonna pop over here to ZBrush now. We'll start showing some of that. Um, so if anybody's looking to get into 3D, um, this program here is a bit on the high end of that, but there are some free options out there that do a really good job. So if you wanted to start digital sculpting or, or messing around with getting stuff ready for 3D printing, um, you can start with a program called Blender. Um, it's open source, free, it'll always be free. That's the mantra they've had. It's really good. They're trying to uh, really to emulate um, a lot of what ZBrush is doing here. But they're doing it for free, which is really cool. And then ZBrush themselves has a has a, a piece of software that's called Sculptress, which is also free. You can download that and use it. Um, you can do a lot of the things that you can do inside this software, but uh, you know it won't do it won't do all the things this will do. So I'm going to start by showing you some of our uh, some of our ongoing projects. So hopefully, if we get things open back up here, we we have an exhibit coming up later this fall that we're calling Skulls. Um, so we're working on a bunch of different things right now. Uh, for example, so this is a largemouth bass. So if you're, uh, if you're into fishing or anything like that, you can recognize this guy. Maybe not, you probably haven't seen him looking quite like this. But so inside ZBrush, it's a completely three-dimensional software. So if you, uh, if you watch movies, the CGI, um, you know, anything with a movie monster was probably sculpted in this program. But this allows us to, uh, to take things and, and alter them, pull them apart. So this started out as one piece, right? So this is a, this is, what we have to here? I'm up to 19 pieces of this bass. This started as one piece and inside of here, I've just been going through and pulling these apart to make this 3D printable. So when you ask if there are things that, that can't be 3D printed, this absolutely couldn't be 3D printed in, in one piece. Um, you, uh, there's some pretty cool stuff going on here. If you haven't, you haven't ever caught a bass, you, uh, you stick your, your finger in its mouth to get your hook back. You, uh, you often get scratched up because they've got all these teeth, but they have them in the back of their throat too. 
species. So if you look at these back here, this is an apparatus that uh, is called a pharyngeal um, gill arch. So this is um, this is basically how a bass keeps things from coming back out of its mouth once it gets in its mouth. It'll come back here and it gets caught in all these other teeth and then it really can't get out. But if you look at this, you can see that um, you know, there's a lot of really small, delicate things going on in there. So we couldn't 3D print that in one piece. And I've still got some floating stuff up here that I've got to reattach. We've got the fins back here. Um, so you can see the, let's see, there we go. So there's the fins back here. You know, this, this absolutely couldn't be 3D printed in its current state with, with any real level of success. So we're going to split this apart into a bunch of different pieces and then we'll 3D print it and then we'll, we'll stick that back together. That's, that's the sort of general process for that. And then we're going to go through, um, you can see here that uh, its eye, while it picked up quite a bit of this, um, fish have a, a strong cartilaginous membrane in their eye that stops it from deforming when they're, when they're getting underwater, right? So if you've ever given, given, if you ever dove into a pool, you've uh, you know, felt the pressure that hits your eyes when you go off into the deep end there. Uh, fish have adaptations that prevent that from happening. So we'll have to come through here and um, using some uh, various tools, we'll have to, you know, manipulate this back into a, a full surface here. And then we can close that out. And then we'll, we'll come back in and fix that. So that's a CT scan. This was provided by the University of Florida. Uh, they have a really cool program down there that they do a lot of a lot of 3D stuff. And then for laser scanning, this guy here was a, a well, this this lady here was a pretty fun project that we've been working on. This is a blue whale skeleton, um, 76 foot long blue whale. So this was from the Noyo Center for Marine Science in Fort Bragg, California. So we went over there last summer and we 3D scanned this entire skeleton. Um, all the bones individually, like I was saying earlier, so if you come in here and look, um, you can take this this humerus here. Oh, sorry, I say humerus and then I grab the, the radius. But So you can grab that and you can move that out and do stuff like that. Um, so this is a, all, all separate. Uh, this, this couldn't be 3D printed currently because there's, you know, you've got all these these floaty bits here. These are these are pretty cool. If you've ever if you ever had your your hand or arm X-rayed after an injury or something, you've seen the bones in there. These are the same bones, but I just call them lumps. They're just I don't know what they're they're so they basically just hold a spot in there. They're just lumps of bone. They really don't have any any real definition or anything. But you know they have the exact same anatomy that we do. They've got got you know I've got menus popping up everywhere. Can't fix it. All right, let's do this the old way. So yeah, if you look at this, it's got a it's got a scapula up here at the top, and it's got a humerus, radius ulna, and then it's got the carpals down here, and then the finger bones. It's pretty cool. So this uh, this animal, like most most whales, was found as a beach specimen. So they had uh, let's see, let's grab the skull here. So this is the skull of that blue whale. So when this animal beached, it's 76 foot long, so there's not a, if you've ever been to the coast of uh, Northern California, there's not a whole lot of 76 foot sections, a real nice sandy beach. So this came into a really rocky area. So what happened is it came in down here head first, and this got lodged into some rocks, and then the wave action sort of split it apart and wrenched it around and broke his skull all up. So what you're seeing here is a big bone puzzle that I'm, I'm working my way through putting together. So what are we up to? We got 49 pieces of this, this cranium so far. It's, uh, somewhere in here are the mandibles, which are just really big. Here they are. So if you look at those compared to the, the size of a human there, Really big skull, got really smashed up though. So that's, yeah, so all these little pieces, I'm still trying to figure out where they are. I've got quite a few of them in there. These two pieces over here in particular are driving me absolutely nuts. So if anybody in here is a 
marine biologist and you can recognize this this shape please let me know they're they're a definite left and right paired thing so they go somewhere along the center line of this this skull but i cannot figure out where they go it's been it's been driving me just a little crazy but we're we're getting there so you can see here um we're gonna put that together and then once this is all together uh, this particular specimen will be online on Morphosource and it'll be downloadable so people can download it and 3D print it, animate it, do whatever they want. So there'll be, there'll be a couple of different versions of this. There'll be the this version here after it gets all put back together and then we'll, uh, we'll reassemble it and uh, we'll put a cleaned up version on there as well that represent what this animal would have looked like in life. And then the other part of what we do is this. So these this is a skull of a prehistoric whale called Bacillosaurus, which means it is the, the king lizard, which is really interesting because it's, it's definitely a whale. Um, this was named way back in the, the day before they realized it was a, uh, a whale, but it was a, yeah. So it's a really cool little animal. Well, little, so they're, these guys are a little over 80 feet long, um, not 80, um, 60, sorry. They're about 66 feet long, so they're not super small, but they're uh, they're one of the early toothed whales. As you can see, they got some really gnarly teeth going on there, and um, they uh, these guys would feed on other whales. They find fairly often the whales skulls um, of another little animal, pretty similar to this, that uh, has you know these teeth impressions in it. They've been crushed and bitten up and. This big monster, guys. So we wanted to 3D print this. So the 3D scans aren't available of it. There's only a few complete skulls of it anywhere in the world. So that left us with the option of just having to sculpt their own. So that's what we're what I'm showing here. So this is a this is a full 3D sculpture. So what's really cool about ZBrush, if you're not familiar with it, is it's a it emulates working with clay. So it's a it's a fake clay type thing. So we'll just Come in here. So I've got a brush down here. It's called the move brush. And you can just grab this stuff and sort of pull it around like it's like it's clay, right? And you can do all sorts of crazy stuff with it. This is why it's super popular in the CG industry. When we're doing this, what we typically do is we'll start with a set of images that we find on Google or something like that. We try and go to the original research papers and things like that. Um, to get that information and then we uh, we do exactly that so we'll start with a, a circle for a, a sphere and we'll just pull it into the general shape and then over time we'll start working in the details so there's a whole suite of really powerful brushes in here that lets us make really good edits to this thing so um, you know you know you can't see it because uh, I'm, I can't see exactly what I'm doing here but I'm using um, a Wacom, which is a 3D computer um, made specifically so I can work on the screen with this pen. And then it lets me essentially just draw directly on the, the screen here in 3D. But it's, it's pressure sensitive, which is really nice. So if I come in here and make really light strokes and then apply more and more pressure, it'll, it'll do that. So it lets me make really precise changes to these models over time. So you can come in here and build areas up and then has all these really nifty tools like this Damien standard brush. So if I wanted to come in here and there's a muscle attachment here, right? So I can come in here and sort of carve this down and bring that around over here. Do that sort of stuff. Then there's some really crazy brushes here in ZBrush. See if I can get some of these to pop up here. Um, yeah, so grab something like this. So if I wanted to give this this thing some ears, come over here and it already has ears. They're down here, like a whale should have them, but if, just for fun, if you wanted to give it a you know a big set of ears, you can draw those on there. Now you've got a a big ear that's in there, and then you know you can if you want to turn this guy into a Vulcan or something like that you can do all that sort of stuff and sculpt it in there it's a really awesome uh, piece of software so if you're, if you're really interested in 3d and you want to try and uh, make a 
make a go at making digital designs and things like that. Eventually, you're gonna wanna you're gonna wanna move up to doing ZBrush here. But uh, yeah, like I said, there's plenty of plenty of free tools out there like Blender and things like that that can do it. Let's see, Let's see draw draw a cactus coming out of his head. It's all sorts of all sorts of weird stuff in here that that gives you that, but it gives you the ability to do that. So when I, um, like I said, when I first start every 3D model, I start with a sphere. So this is exactly how that Bacillosaurus skull started. And then it's just a matter of coming through here and you know, manipulating this guy to get it into the shape you want. It takes takes quite a while. I'm getting I'm pretty fast at it. I can knock out these skulls in a couple of days now, but it used to take me you know, a month or so when I first started doing this to uh, get to where I could do this with any sort of thing. In fact, this this Bacillosaurus skull itself was one of my one of my first 3D models that I ever completed start to finish, and I've just recently gone back to it. So all these new details and things is, is stuff that I've just done here in the past day or so bringing this model back up because it I was really proud of it three years ago when I did it but when I opened it back up here recently I was like oh man that looks like Gumby just no detail just smooth just just goofy but that's how it goes right you always got to start off small and then work your way up so things like like these nerve foramina in here oops turn that off can show you that that's a pretty cool little feature let's see why can't i move this menu gotta you can see me stabbing at it here i have a menu that is sitting right over where i need it to be let's see uh oh come on Oh, there it goes. Hey, we got it. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So if you look at this model, you can see there's a, you get in here really close. This is what we call topology in 3D world. So these are, these are literal polygons. They're just little squares that make things up. You can see I got some triangles in here too, because I've been using some, some uh, tools to get this thing where I need it to be. So what's really nice about ZBrush is if we come in here with a big brush, we just make a, a big gross shape there. You'll see it starts stretching those polygons out and it breaks them down and really makes it so that it becomes unusable. So if I was trying to sculpt on this again, right, it's not gonna, it's not gonna do that much for me. But this button, up here that I just clicked this purple button at the top that my cursor is having over called Dynamesh. What that'll do is it'll go back through and it'll re-topologize this model for me and then it'll give me the ability to come back in and start sculpting it again and then I can re-Dynamesh. So when I was mentioning that you can buy a program called Scul or Download Sculptures for free, you can see ZBrush has integrated that directly into the, the program here. So there's Sculptures Pro Mode now ZBrush and what that does is it'll automatically do that on the fly and this is what Sculptures does and this is why Sculptures is really good right so if you're if you're just learning how to do things you don't have to worry about your topology and stuff like that you can just come in here and sculpt and sculpt and sculpt you don't have to worry about dynameshing you don't have to worry about fixing your broken mesh all you're doing is just trying to make a, a cool 3d shape that maybe you want a 3d print or something it'll do that Continuously on the fly for as long as you want to go. But if you uh, if you look here, you can see where my cursor is hovering over these numbers. That's something that can get you into trouble. Sort of like a, a reverse ammo counter in Aliens that's counting down to doom. That's sort of counting up to, to doom there. The more polygons you have, the slower your computer is going to start going. That number just keeps keeps cranking up there. So it's pretty easy to get bogged down pretty quick and then the, the Sculptures Pro mode is fully dependent on the size of your brush. So if you go even smaller, 
with your brush, it'll pack even fewer polygons in there. But you can see that's a really cool way to, you know, some terrible sculpting I did there, but it gives you the ability to come in there and sculpt up some, I don't know, what was he? Maybe an extra from, from Rocky Seven, where Rocky has to fight a prehistoric whale, and this is after 15 rounds of getting punched in the head. Is this going to be printed for the skulls exhibit? Possibly. Um, we're still working on the, the list for that. Um, uh, I would I would like it to be. It's pretty cool. There's uh, there's not a whole lot of these uh, around the world in museums for whatever reason. There, people really enjoy this this crazy whale. But uh, yeah, there's there's nobody making replica versions of this. You don't see them very often in museums. It's the State Palace of Alabama. So if you go to the Alabama Natural History Museum, there's they have a, a full, nearly 70 foot long version of this hanging from their ceiling, which is just awesome to see. And they have four or five other skulls there because they get quite a few. I think it's a state fossil of Mississippi too. Mississippi and Alabama, they always gotta, always gotta copy each other. There's another cool little feature of these things. So they're, they're asymmetric. So like our skulls are, whoops, they're, uh, they're asymmetric. So when you look at us, you know, we're the same left and right. Uh, they think this is a, they don't have the same anatomy that allows them to echolocate. Um, it's called a melon on whales. So if you look at whales, they got that big bulb on their head. Um, these animals didn't have that. So they think this, this asymmetrical shape to their face allowed them to determine uh, where the sounds are coming from more accurately, right? So if you got a, a curve one way, the sound will hit that side slightly different than it hits the other. And then you get, you can echolocate that way. Yeah, at full scale, this these things are uh, a little over five and a half feet long. They're really big animals. And these these teeth, of course, are big, massive, gnarly teeth. You can see why they're eating other whales. Which is really weird. The other whales look very similar to them. They're just smaller. It seems sort of unfortunate and a little messed up. So yeah, we just come through. We'll sculpt this stuff up. So one thing I like to do is leave these brush strokes in here, because eventually that'll that'll all be detailed. So if you look at a if you look at a skull up close, you know they're they're not smooth. There's bumps and little holes and things all over the place. So if you if you leave this sort of stuff when you're sculpting in there. And then you dynamash. It'll recalculate that, and I'll clean this up, um, smooth it down just a little bit. But really, don't want to smooth it down a whole lot. You can get some get some brushes like this clay fill brush here, and turn down the intensity, and just sort of work around the edge there. And then you you don't have a, a really strong seam, but you still have all your details that are in there. But if you're, if you're wanting to get into ZBrush, um, you can see down here at the bottom of the screen, I've got um, all of these brushes. So if you open this up, you know, there's 50, 60 some odd brushes that come with this thing. You can really get lost in the weeds in here with, with all this different stuff. But these are, uh, these are the, well, except for this one, ignore that. It's a, that is not a brush I use. There we go. So now we're back to normal. I don't, I don't sculpt with cactuses a whole lot when I'm working on skulls. Yeah, the standard brush is, um, come in here so you can see, um, it just does sort of like a, like a tube, just basically what it says it'll do. The Damien standard brush just makes a nice little cut for you. You know, you can curve it, of course. And then the clay buildup, or the clay brush, sort of like working with, with clay, right? So it'll, It'll build it up, but it does it in sort of a wet way, right? This sort of looks goopy. And then if you look at the clay buildup brush, it does it more with a, a hard edge. That's because if you look over here, there's a, a brush alpha. It gets it gets really deep. ZBrush is really crazy. But you can, you know, if you wanted to sculpt, you can come in here and let's see. You fix this, you can actually see what I'm doing here. 
So if you wanted to sculpt, you could sculpt the stars, right? So there's stars in there if you wanted to do something like that. You might not think there's a, a need for that, but you know, if you come in here, if you're working on a, a character for you know a movie or something and he's he's a horribly disfigured Bond villain that's been in some sort of weird fire or something, you can come in there with that star tool and then sort of bring that down. And just real quick, there you've got some some pretty passable burn scars, which I don't think Basilosaurus would have had since they were living in the ocean, but you never know. It's super close to a meteor impact or something. And then um, this is a new brush that um, this extractor brush is pretty cool, but uh, that one gets then we got our, our move brushes. So I'm usually I'm usually only using you know, five or six different brushes out of this entire suite. Um, we really we really just go as as deep into the pool as you want to go, or you can stay pretty shallow and, and make some pretty cool stuff. So Jesse, what would be your three top um, advice, pieces of advice for people wanting to get into 3D sculpting and scanning and printing? Start small, um, download a free program and just um, Take your time, learn the basics. Don't jump in and start trying to do um, crazy stuff like these skulls and things like that. You know, start start with uh, you know simple things. Just try and sculpt a you know, hands aren't really simple, but you got them right. You can look at your hand and you can you know give it five fingers and work on that. the The main thing is just to keep keep at it, right? This is it's it's a great tool to have, but it's also really frustrating, right? If you're you're looking at a picture of stuff and the probably the biggest mistake you can do is um, go online and start looking at other people's work right because you're going to be judging yourself based on people who have been doing this stuff for a decade or more and it's just even for myself i've been doing this for for over five years it's just soul crushing to see some work that people do but you know it's a process just keep at it uh, start small start basic don't try and jump in too soon you're going to get frustrated and you know, that's when people quit is when they try and do too much too soon and then they start feeling bad about the work they're doing so start simple just do some cartoony things you know um we do a we do a summer camp here at the museum we have middle school students come in and sculpt the first couple of days we just have them do things like sculpt cartoon characters and you know little ducks and things just stuff to, to familiarize yourself with the tools that's the important part right is to, to come in here and say oh what is this what does this damien standard brush do Oh, well, it, it makes these cuts. Well, if you, um, what happens if you hold the Alt key down, well, it, it inverts that, so you get, a, you get a ridge instead of a cut. So you can just play around with the basics. Um, start small. And then, um, you know, if you wanted to get into 3D printing, there's uh, quite a few budget options out there. Don't, don't spend a lot of money. Don't buy into the, the brand name hype with 3D printers. 3D printers are, are pretty much 3D printers. Um, the you know the the cheapest one that i'd recommend is something like an ender 3 pro which is about 250 dollars brand new that'll print everything you want that you know an eight nine hundred dollar printer can do it might might be a little slower but um, you might have to print a little smaller because it has a you know a smaller build volume to it but it'll it'll do everything you can so don't feel like you need to, to buy a thousand dollar machine to make really cool stuff in fact this uh you know, these guys here, those are those are printed on a machine that costs about four hundred dollars. They they do a really good job. You don't need anything super fancy. In fact, this this machine behind me is incredibly expensive, but it doesn't print any better than than this. It just prints really big and it's made to run for a really long time and it came with a, a really good warranty on it. But yeah, just start small. Um, I always always like to start with with just bones, if you want to learn anatomy, uh, I think it's important to learn to learn bones. You got to learn the underlying structure of it, right? So if you if you look at stuff like my face here, it's not the that's the most attractive thing to have looming over your face in a screen, but you know you can look at things like the underlying bone structure there and understand how that works. So yeah, start small, stick with it. Don't don't <laughs> compare yourself to, to other artists. I I, I give that advice, but I still do it. Every time I pop on Instagram, I see some stuff and I'm like, ah, 
good grief then go look at their timeline and realize they've been doing it for like three months and just feel awful about myself but at the end of the day you're you're doing it for fun you're doing it for yourself so don't is it is it helpful to have a background in art to have artistic abilities so my wife and i argue about this she says yes but i don't think it is um you know we have our internship program here and currently i have four students who are all doing this um two of those students have um, digital sculptures similar to this in the smithsonian when they open the new exhibit hall uh, one of those is a geologist she has no art background she she hates art and Every time you ask her about it, she says everything she does is awful, and I have to keep reminding her that she has artwork in the Smithsonian, so her work isn't awful. Uh, one of our other students is a mass comm major, focusing on social media. We have a biologist and a computer science major, and they're all doing this stuff, and they all had no backgrounds in it. So it's just pick it up and play with it. You know, if you if the passion is there, if you want to create, just create. You don't you don't need an art degree. I, saying that, my one of the the other employee that works there is an art major we we if anything it makes his life more difficult because when he messes up we're like but tim you're an artist how could you do this <laughs> this is what you do for a living but. well if we don't have any other questions do you have anything else jesse hey, sergey see you you raised a hand you is there a is there a question i just saw a hand pop up. I'm new to the Zoom thing, I'm sorry. If you use the Q&A um, option down at the bottom, we can answer questions that way. I know he's on Facebook. Is he maybe coming from Facebook or is that a Zoom thing? It's through oh. Zoom, yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> Okay, well, that's just about um, our time. Um, thank you, Jesse. That was fun. I don't think I can do it, but thank you. Oh, just he does have a question. Yeah, go for it. Give him a second. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so 3D printing is fairly new to the, the scene, right? And I think it's really important um, long term in terms of conservation and things because a lot of people, uh, people like skulls. A lot of people just like seeing skulls. A lot of people collect skulls and that sort of thing. But you have animals that are, that are critically endangered, that are threatened, that sort of thing. Um, people still want those skulls, right? So your only option at that point is a black market. So you can 3D print things um, to give people a, a reasonable facsimile of something that, that they don't necessarily need to have um, the real thing, right? A lot of people are gonna want that real thing, but you can 3D print a hyena skull and resin that looks exactly like a, like a regular hyena skull. There's no need to, to do that. If you wanted a, you know, an elephant skull, you can 3D print those, you can do those sorts of things. And it's also a great educational tool. So if you wanted to, again, I'll use the example of a hyena skull. If you're working in wildlife conservation and you want to educate people about anatomy and critically endangered animals and things like that, you know, if you if you need a, a hyena skull to do that, those things are fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars. You don't you don't have the budget for it. You can 3D print those for less than two hundred dollars and it looks just as good. It, it'll hold up, it's plastic, right? So if somebody drops it, you're not destroying a, a natural history item, you're destroying a piece of plastic, you can 3D print another one. And it really increases the outreach opportunity for this stuff and makes it so that more people can get it in their hands and you can disseminate things that, um, yeah, might otherwise come from an illegally traded animal. Oh no, I was wondering if your thylico smile has showed up. Okay, well, if we don't have any other questions, um, we will end our live in just a minute. Um, join us next week for Dr. Andy Spear talking about the life of a projectile point in archeology. span um, And again, thank you, 
uh, Jesse for telling us about 3D printing, sculpting. I'm, I'm still don't think I can do it, but <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad that you're with us and can do it because you've done some pretty awesome things. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.